Uh, so I was saying that thank you so much for all of you for coming. Uh, it's very important for us uh, these moments where you can share uh, what we do and share about technology and what we are passionate about. Mandera is a software house. We were founded in 2014 and one of the main reasons or for our existence is always these moments of sharing and working with people that we enjoy uh, working with. Um, and it's very important to, to us to have a full house and have people here. So we are going to have two talks today, one about Kafka uh, and another about microservices. Um, we will also have food for you guys to enjoy, so some uh, roasted chicken is going to come and <laughs> other stuff, so please enjoy. There's beverages in the fridge, um, please feel free to, to drink and to eat. Uh, once again, welcome and welcome Ricardo, uh, which is going to be the first presenter today. Let's go. So as Daniel said, I'm Ricardo Neves. I'm going to talk about Kafka 101 with Spring Boot. Uh, I'm Ricardo Neves again. <laughs> I'm 29 years old. I joined Mindera back in 2016. Uh, I, I always worked with backend, a little bit frontend sometimes, <laughs> but yeah, mainly backend. And I'm a professional FPV drone crasher, and I have to build them as well. So I, I really enjoy uh, flying drones. I also enjoy to run. I did my first middle marathon uh, this year, and I also enjoy riding motorcycle. This is a photo of me in um, in National Two, National Two road that crosses from north to south in Portugal in my social media if you want to, to follow me, and that's it. So, who's here ever heard of Kafka? <laughs> good, good. Who's here uh, ever uh, used Kafka? Nice, nice, nice. Who's here like Kafka? <laughs> <laughs> that's good, that's good, okay. So, so in this talk I will talk a little bit about what is Apache Kafka, and most of you already know what, what it is. I'm, all, I'm also going to give a brief presentation about some Kaf Kafka uh, terminology, like some, some words that are fancy and you, you need to know what they, they mean. Then I'll do a demo showing a simple consumer and a simple producer. Then I'm, I'm going to speak about Schema Registry, Kafka Streams API, showing again a demo with Kafka Streams API, Kafka Connect, and again a little demo. Uh, with Kafka Connect. So, let's begin. What is Apache Kafka? It's an open source message broker uh, that was developed by, by LinkedIn. It, it basically is a published subscriber um, um, architecture. And the, future, the features are, it's distributed, it's replicated, scalable, durable, and high throughput. It's th those are only like fancy words for what it does, and sometimes they are they might not be that true if you don't configure it well. But yeah, um, and it's used to process large amount of, of information like in, in real time. Um, so let's begin from the basics and what is a broker? Like a broker is like an instance that is running um, the Kafka Kafka process. Um, I can say that and. Um, it manages all partitions, which we are going to see what partitions are, but it manages all partitions and it handles all the reads and the writes requests. Also, they manage replication of partitions because, as I said, it's replicated and it's distributed, scalable as well, so it needs to replicate everything. And normally, it's recommended to have several brokers in, in production, uh, so you have, again, distributed, replica replicated, and so on. So, what's a message? It's just a piece of information that is composed by a key and a value. Nothing different from, from that. And Kafka saves every message uh, as bytes because it makes it easier for Kafka. It doesn't need to understand um, what is there. It just needs to, to know that there are information there and it's plain bytes. Uh, as I said, everything is a key value structure. And the keys or values can also be null, so yeah. Um, the key is used by, by, by the broker to choose the, the partition where uh, the message is going to enter. And I will show in the demo how this works. Um, and you can store in every 
format almost that you want. You can store a string in JSON in Avro, because in the end, for Kafka, it's just bytes, nothing more. So uh, here you see a diagram. So you have an application, you have the cluster with a topic or more than one, and you have the consumer. Uh, your application is writing, for example, in a string or a double or a JSON. So you need, you need to have a serializer. What it does, it just converts this information to bytes, as I said. And the consumer needs to have a deserializer to convert back um, from bytes to uh, whatever it wants. Um, every, every communication is done in plain TCP to maximize performance again. And yeah, that, that's basically it. You have already some built-in SERDIS, and SERDI mean serializer this serializer, it goes both, both ways, and you have double, integer, long, string, and some, some others. Um, and then we have a topic, so this is like the, the most basic and where you start communicating between microservices, uh, because instead of having communication with HTTP, you use topic for that, and as you, as you saw, some producer and some, some consumer, and you, all the medium for communication is that topic. So topic can be organized to um, categorize the messages. You can, of course, do whatever you want with topics, but it's usually by categorization of information. And each topic needs, needs to have um, like a name, and it needs to be unique. Um, again, topics then have one or more partitions. And you, you can think about partitions like different queues uh, inside a, a given topic. A topic is not, not limited by a number of partitions, but as we are going to see uh, next, the partitions are the, uh, the parallelization, what allows the parallelization uh, when working with Kafka. Also, if you see here, partition 0, 1, and 2 have messages. Each, each message, is, message is represented by um, this square, right? Message 0, 1, 2, and the 0, the 1, the 2, until the 12, for example here, it means the offset of the message. The offset is always incremented, and it starts from zero to whatever you, you are producing, and it's like um, it's like a queue. It's zero, one, two, and so on. Uh, yeah, and uh, so a producer is, yeah, you know, it's something that produces to a topic, and the consumer, it's also a little bit trickier because a producer only produces and works um, alone, but the consumer might not be working alone. You can have an alone consumer that is consuming from a topic, but you also have, have the, um, uh, the concept of a consumer group. And wh what is that? So it's just a set of consumers that work together to, to consume from a topic. So as I said, if you have many partitions, you can have one consumer, but you can have several consumers that parallelize all that, all that work. Um, yeah, that's basically that's basically what the consumer is. So imagine this case: you have a topic T1 with four partitions, right? And you have one consumer group with one consumer, and that consumer is doing all the work. Is consuming from zero, one, two, and three. But if you add another one, they should split equally, and they should have two partitions each. This sometimes may not happen uh, because how Kafka works, but it should happen like that. And if you add for, for uh, consumers, you have four consumers for four partitions, so everyone is happy and every partition has its own consumer, and this will increase the, the performance, of course. If you, have a, if you add another one, it will be just sleeping there, waiting for some consumer to die or, and take over his work. That's, that's it. Um, and you can also have uh, two consumer groups uh, consuming from the same topic. This, like, the consumer groups won't cooperate between each other. They will consume the same messages, but they will do uh, different work. Uh, hopefully they will do different work, otherwise your architecture is wrong. Uh, yeah. Um, so, now we will enter the concept of the lag. The lag, when you have lag, something is wrong, and you don't want to have lag. But basically, if you are I actually, I can go here. If you are producing to a topic, or lag is always tied to a partition and to a consumer group. If your consumer group is on, for example, 
partition 100. But the last produced message is on partition 130. You know that your log is 30. It means just it missing, it's missing to process 30 messages. Uh, so you are behind 30 messages. So less lag, uh, more, more performant is your application, and less delay will have when, um, uh, when processing messages. Okay, now I'll show you an example, a really simple example with a consumer and a producer. Um, and basically I, I built um, uh, a Spring Boot application um, that has an endpoint and that produces to a topic called input topic, our original, right? <laughs> and that consumes from that topic, just that. Um, so let me switch back to... Can you see the screen, Bob? It's okay. Everything is what? It's really tiny. Okay. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Cool. Good. So this is a Spring Boot application. You're familiar with it, right? Already. We already worked with Spring Boot. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, so you have the palm here, and you need uh, a couple of dependencies. So for this consumer, I already have dependencies for for streams, but we need this Spring Kafka dependency. This is for later. Lombok, sometimes we need it. And it's, that's basically what we need, uh, if I'm not uh, missing something. And then, okay. And then here we're just configuring some bins, like we need to say where is Kafka, and it's the address is here, and we need to see to say the key serializer and value serializer. In this case, they will be both strings for the producer, okay? And that's, for now, that's basically it. I also have a Docker Compose that is already run, running, I hope. And it has something called okay, Zookeeper, and Zookeeper is going out of Kafka, but it's managing the Kafka brokers themselves. So sometimes it doesn't work that well. Zookeeper is like um, the, the not the strongest point of Kafka, but yeah, you need it to run for now. You have also the Kafka broker uh, with some configurations. I just created some initial topics and schema registry I'll talk about then. And we just have a fancy user interface to see uh, the messages and all the topics called AKHQ. Kafka Connect is for, connect is for, for later, and that's it. Um, so in my controller, let's go again. I have the, the endpoint. This endpoint receives a message, an object message that has a key and a value. It will not be simpler than that. And it will just go to this service here that will use the bin that I created, the Kafka template one. String is the key and the string is the value. And it will just send to that topic. Okay. So after that, I have also a Kafka listener, and this is an annotation on Spring Boot that creates a consumer. And there are some nice things to see here. First, the topic that is consuming from, the consumer group name, and the concur concurrency. This means like this consumer, this consumer will have uh, one task. Um, so one task or one thread. So yeah, that's basically it. I will tweak it later so you can see. And then uh, a log. That's basically it. So if I if I call this endpoint, let me run it. Good. So if I call the endpoint, HTTP to that to that with a key and with a value. Awesome. Now if we go to that interface that I talked about, the KHQ, if you refresh it. You see that I gave permission just to create the topic. It wasn't there. And you see that our message will be there. So the key, user ID 1, and the value Kafka producer and consumer. And you also might notice something interesting. There is a consumer group called Redis Consumer Group, which I define it here. And when we see the consumer group is green and lag is zero, so it means that it already consumed the message. And if we see, yeah, in fact, it consumed the message, so lag is zero because only one message was produced. Um, 
if we enter the consumer group, you can see some interesting things like, okay, this is a topic, it has only one partition, partition zero, the offset is one, because you produce one message, so zero, one, and lag is zero. So this is the, the information about this consumer group on this particular topic. And then we have the members. You have one thread, which is this one, that is consuming from one topic, partition zero. So you don't have more partitions, so everything is as expected. One thread, one partition. Great. So now I can, um, I can uh, start tweaking this a bit. So let's do some things and let's edit this topic. And where? Actually, I need to delete it. <laughs> but let's, I need to scale down. I'll, I'll create a new topic we took with four partitions, for example. Let's delete, never do this in production, by the way. <laughs> let's create another one. So input topic, oh, four partitions. Okay. So you are, now I have a, a topic with four partitions. It's the same, you just have four queues, four different queues. If you run this again, now Kafka needs to worry where the message should, should fall in, which, in which partition. Um, so let's produce the same one. And if we go here, again, like zero, and it produces to partition zero. But now, let's go to consumer groups. And, sorry. And see the members. You see, since the, the um, since the concurrency is one, you have one thread do, doing all the work. This thread is, is doing the four partitions work, which might not be ideal. So we can tweak this and put four. We have CPU, so it's okay. So in this case, we we were talking in the beginning. We were talking something like this. It was doing everything, but now it should be doing this. We won't notice any performance here because we are not testing performance, but it should increase the performance, of course. So now if you go to members, you see that you have one assignment to each client ID, which is the thread. You can say it's a thread or a task. Good, okay. Now we understand the concurrency. We understand the partitions. We also can test another thing. Like this message was in partition zero. If I produce another one, I hope I don't re regret saying this, but it will fall in the same partition because the key is the same. And Kafka allows that every message with the same key will fall every time in the same partition. It will only can change if you change the number of partitions on the fly. If you now I change the number of partitions without deleting the topic, it will fall in another partition. But this one should fall in the same partition, which is partition zero. zero. So let's go, let's go. Partition zero, you see? Offset one. But now, if I produce with another key, just you can see, it should fall in another partition, which I don't know what it is, or it can fall in the same one. <laughs> <laughs> Try again. Try again. Let me see. They're falling all the same. What are the odds, right? Oh, different one. Okay, what this allows us. If we're handling, for example, money or some other kind of transactions, if the, user, if the key is, for example, the user ID, you can keep the order. Everything will fall in the same partition. So everything fall in partition 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So you won't lose the order of the, the transactions. And if it's a different user, it might fall in a different one, but it's guaranteed that same key, always same partition, which is helpful in some cases. Uh, now I can create, let me comment, stop. Now we can, we can make this example work, which is having another consumer group doing different stuff. Different stuff is a different print. So it's same consumer group, um, called DB Consumer Group, the concurrency is one, is one, it's okay, and it's printing, receive message to store database information, and the other one was storing in Redis. So, if we started this, you, 
can see something interesting. It consumed uh, every message that was there. Why? Because when, when you create a new consumer group, all the offsets for that consumer group for each partition starts with null. Yeah, that's, that's a bit stupid, but that, that's how it works. So then you have this property, auto offset reset. If it's set to early, earliest, it says, okay, go further back uh, until you, you don't have anything more and start from there. So it started from the beginning of all partitions and it consumed every message. Uh, and if we com come to AKHQ again, we will see that now that topic has two consumer groups. And every consumer group has lag of zero, but the red is as four threads, and the database has only one. So this is expected, everything seems fine. As I said, this is useful when you want to, like this, you want to uh, consume a message and read from the same topic and do different processing and write for the database and the other one write for Redis or something else. They are independent. If one gets lag, the other one won't because lag is tied to the partition slash consumer group slash topic. So they are completely independent. Okay. So, a a anyone has a question regarding this, or I can continue? Everything good? Okay. Can we use the stream as a database? It means what? How long does the message stay in the stream? In the topic? Yeah. How long as you want? It's a configuration. Can we use it as a database? You can. You can. You can. I'll show later. But you, you don't use a topic alone for the database. You use something that is RocksDB and Ktables to store data in Kafka. Yeah, but I'll show later how it works, so don't worry. But you can, there is a property called retention period, where you say, re stay with that message for, you can set it to infinity. So, yeah. So, now, let's speak about schema registry, because this is also interesting. Because now, our message doesn't have any format. You can send whatever you want. I'm sending a string. But by mistake, I can send a long or something else, and it will screw up the, the consumer, because it's not expecting a long, for example. So schema registry is a separated from Kafka Brokers. It's a different service. And Kafka Brokers speak with schema registry and our services as well. And it defines, basically, a contract between the producer and the consumers. So the producer will be um, obligated to follow a, a format. If it doesn't follow that format, it won't produce the message. So it's, uh, it's very good for you not being awake like at 4 a.m. saying, oh, I received the wrong message, the topic is lagging very well, so I don't want that. So I recommend using, from the beginning, a schema registry. Um, it provides data consistency and compatibility, of course, and each, uh, each scheme has an ID, um, and it also doesn't need to send the schema over the wire. Like, when you, s you send a message, you only send the message itself with the bytes that you serialize, and, and schema ID, and that's all. Schema registry is also split into parts. It's a REST service, service because you call it on your uh, application, like to validate, to store, and to retrieve schemas. And it also has serializers and deserializers that connect to your Kafka uh, and under all, all the storage of the retrieval. Because when you start the application, and it queries every time when you start it, the schema registry saying, what are the schemas that you have? And they store it locally. Um, so that they can see if the, the message is valid or not. So the schema, as I said, defines the structure of a message. can have several types like Avro, JSON, or Protobuf. Uh, I'll, I'll foco, focus on Avro schemas because that, that's what I know. <laughs> but it's most recommended as well. And each format uh, handles a different way, serialization and deserialization. But all um, handle those details for you. You don't need to worry about that. So this is like the problem that I found. You have a message with a new ID, a content, and a timestamp. This is only the value. I don't, didn't put here the key, so it doesn't confuse you. But if that's what I expected, the UID is going to have a trim here. So for now, it's good. It doesn't have spaces, so trim doesn't do anything, but also doesn't break. But now the producer remembered from nothing. Let's remove the UID because I want. <laughs> 
So then the, the consumer didn't do, and then he did a trim on UID and you have a null pointer exception and you break your, your consumer, which you, you don't want. So schema registry is here to solve this problem. So how it works, I already explained it. You have a producer, you start it up. When there is no schema and you try to produce a message with a given schema, if there is nothing there, it will just register that schema and it won't validate against anything because it's nothing there to validate. Uh, then, when you put up the consumer, it will request all the schemas and we will save everything locally. And then you can send your information with schema plus the data, serialize and consumer deserialize everything and solve it. And I don't want to, <laughs> to talk a, in a lot of details about this, but you have several compatibility types uh, because your schema needs to evolve over time. You might need to add new fields, you might need to delete fields. You might need to change fields names and each compatibility type will tell you what you can do and what is allowed to do. For example, in backward, you can delete fields and if you delete a field, I think I can continue, no? Yeah. 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 So, like, I, as I said, if you have a, a backward, I'm just giving two examples. If you delete a field, you need to update your consumer first because you need to update to not consume that field in particular. Um, and you have a bunch of them, which I won't talk about, but you have, this is the list. But basically the transitives go to all previous versions of that schema and the non-transitives don't, do, just see the previous one. And you have the none, which actually I don't know why, why it's there. <laughs> so, now, another demo. We have a producer, again. almost the same one, but the endpoint changed, produced with schema. And I created a schema. And the schema, this is Avro, it's just a JSON that says, okay, this schema has this name, this name space, and I'll show you why it's needed. And it has the following fields, UID, which is a string, and this is just for documentation, the content, which also is a string, and the timestamp, which is a long. Um, and then we also need on POM, by the way, to have something to support this, which is those two dependencies. We need the Avro and the Avro serializer, which also has, has the serializer, I think. And then we need something that is really useful, is this Avro plugin. What is this? This picks up this, uh, the schema and transforms it in a Java class for you. So you can have an object that you can play with and send the message directly to, to the brokers. It will be serialized, of course, and deserialized automatically. So, I, and I also need to, to create this bin, this producer factory, which is the same as before, but it also has the, um, the schema registry URL. And that's, that's it. So my controller is doing almost the same, but as you see, it's creating, also I forgot to show you, it created this class. It's you know, when you run Maven generate source, it creates this class. It's a mess, but you can see uh, somewhere the fields are here. Okay, so you can use it how you want. So I created the class. It also has a builder. I set the UID, the content, the timestamp, and everything should be okay because this scheme is not reg reg registered. Uh, I think I'm not forgetting anything, so let's just give it a go. Also, I'm using a different topic, I believe. Input topic schema. Great. So, let's go again. Okay, same thing, just different topic. Okay, so now, if we go to our AKHQ, there will be something, some things that are interesting here. 
So you have the new topic. Actually, I forgot to set the consumer, which is okay. Can you zoom in a bit? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So this is the topic. There is no consumer group because I forgot to turn it on. But you see the message here. It has the same key, but the format is the format that you want, that you define. And something else, also something interesting. Your schema was, was registered in the schema register, and you have all the schema that you defined. It's the same file that you had in the, in the IntelliJ. You have the type, and you have something important, which is a version. So whenever this schema evolves, it will increase the version, uh, like version 2, 3, 4. Uh, so it will keep, you can keep track of, of the versions. That's basically it. So I was able to produce the message, and the schema was created. So I should be now able to consume it, because I forgot to uncomment the Kafka listener for this. So different topic. Uh, it should only consume that message that I that I did, and I'm consuming it as, as generic record, and I'm, I'm getting the value. Uh, let me see. Maybe the default is not. Yeah, as you see here, receive message, key, and content. Everything fine. Uh, now, I actually forgot to show you something. The compatibility type. So, we can just for fun <laughs> change this to full. Why not? And I not find it. Go for it. Was it safe? Yes. So, let's go back a bit. Uh, sorry. So, let me zoom in, maybe. So, but basically the full it only lets you add optional fields and delete optional fields. You can do anything more. Just the advantage is that there is no order to make the update because everything is optional. You need to handle it like it can be null. So uh, if I go here to my schema and try to add an optional field, by the way, an option field is like the type is null or a string. So if it's not sent, it's null. Uh, and I go here to my controller that calls this and add my option field. See, it doesn't, doesn't exist because I didn't generate my class, so. Okay, this will run the, the Maven script, the Maven plugin, and generate the new class for me. Now, it should be here, okay? So now it's same thing, but with a different field which is allowed by the full compatibility. It's allowed to add optional fields. Again, let's go, send a message. Everything is good. Just speed this up a bit. And then go to topics. The schema should have two, three, okay. And then the new one is here. Content, option, uh, optional content. Great. So it worked as it should, but now, I'm a bit distracted and I want to add some mandatory field because I want to add it. This shouldn't work, right? Because it's against the full compatibility mode. You cannot add fields that are mandatory. So let's run again the generate sources. Takes a bit. Yeah. And then set content. It. Hopefully, if this works correctly, it should give, um, I think it's a 409 saying you cannot do that. So it shouldn't produce the message to the topic. Okay, 500. <laughs> but schema, schema being registered is incompatible, incompatible with an early schema, 409. And if you go to, again, the topic, it's not there. So you're safe with this because it will never produce a poison message to, to a topic, which is great. Can it produce or send messages to the previous version? I think it can. I think it can, yeah. If it's transitive, by the way, I'm not sure if it will allow. Yeah, I think it will. That's a good question. And how will consumers handle it? Because That's a good question, which I don't know how to answer right now. Yeah, yeah, but it's valid, yeah.
I can I can see later how it works. Yeah, but that's a valid question. question. Uh, the version is generated. Uh, oh, it's just incremental. Incremental. Yeah, yeah. I forgot to show you that. So when I create a new schema, you see, yeah. you if you go here, you, you have, have two to versions. You point on the the other schema. You don't have what? To point to point the average schema that the version no. changed. No, 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 no. You just need to evolve it like the rules say, allow you to do. So yeah, it should just create, it's sequential, yeah, okay. just that. Anyone else? Wait. So let's, let's keep, keep going. Okay. So we talk about producer, consumer, now we have Kafka Streams which is both a producer and a consumer at the same time. Uh, it's, a, it's a library um, that lives on your application. The syntax is some similar uh, with the um, Java 8 streams. Um, and the, big, the, the good thing, I believe, is that all processing is inside your application. Nothing happens on the broker. So if you have something that it's really heavy to process, it's your application that needs to handle. So you just need to scale it or, or and handle with it. Um, so, okay, what is a stream? It's just an unbounded continuous real-time flow of records. Uh, again, messages going flowing and the stream is <laughs> the, the group of the messages. Also, it can be stateless or st stateful. So, yeah. And you can do operations like joins, grouping, aggregations, filter. I won't speak about every operation that you can, can do because we won't uh, live here like for today so what what is the architecture you have uh, first it's important to understand that they, they, they define something like we have a processor topology and um, you have like a graph of stream processors and the nodes um, are connected by the streams so and you also can have you see, if you see here you can have like state stores for example, this makes some logic, this node makes another logic, and they are consuming from a topic, and then they can merge in another stream, and then you can process that stream to another stream or to another topic. It's like continuous, you can have a bunch of streams consuming from streams and streams and so on, and saving state along, along the way. Uh, yeah, that's, that's basically the same thing. You just have the concept of source, source processor, which consumes directly from topics, and sync that produces directly for topics. This is just an example of some stateless transformations. You can do a branch, and what a, what a branch does is it, it consumes all this from a topic with, with the key string and the value long, and whenever this is true, it will save it in a position of an array. For example, everything that is in branch zero will be when a key starts with A, branch one with key starts with B, and if nothing this is true, the other one will be true, so everything else will be to branch two. This is the branch, which will be deprecated and will be replaced by split, but yeah. So then we have like the filter, and you already know the filter. It's a simple filter like we have on, um, on, uh, on Java stream, so nothing fancy here, just filter the ones that are more than zero. So, great. You also have the, the map, which again is the same thing as you have in Java streams. Uh, but you have also the map and map values. This map, you see something different, is this key value pair. You can change the entire key value type. You just don't change the value or the key, you can change both if you want. If you just, just want to change the value, you can use the map values, which is more, more efficient. And you also have the select, select key, which allows you to select key, like your value can be the key in this case, your, your, your key is the, um, the first, word of a given um, of a given message you have a bunch of others like flash map, map for each peak print group by and so on which we won't see here and then we have the stateful transformations and you can aggregate things i won't give a, a lot of detail here but when you aggregate like different streams you need to have a, like a window in time, because it's an unbounded flow of data. If you want to aggregate this stream with this one, you need to select a window, because otherwise it's infinite. You cannot do that. So 
um, that, that, uh, that's something to be considered with. And let's not go in details with this, but you can aggregate several streams. Uh, uh, and that's, that's it. Also, there are two abstractions in streams, in, actually in, uh, in, case, in, um, sorry, in streams API. You have case streams and case tables. Case streams just follow, the, um, follow this par paradigm, like you have a stream, you have an unbounded um, um, list of messages, per se. So it deals with facts and events, but K tables, no. K tables have the current state, and I'll, I'll talk about, a little bit about that. So streams are infinite, the tables are finite, bounded. The K streams are append only. I forgot to mention that, but you cannot delete a message from, K, from a stream or for, from a topic. It's impossible. You can skip it in the offset, but you cannot delete it. K tables is the opposite. You can insert, update, delete. You can do all, all that kind of stuff. As I said, K streams are immutable. K tables are mutable. And K tables use something like RocksDB. It's not like, it's only RocksDB uh, to save a given state. So if you have a K stream, imagine this is a topic which offset zero is key one, value one, and so on. So if you transfer that to a K table, it will just keep the latest values. As you see, you have a key one, value one, because the key um, one was never updated after the first event, but key two, key two was updated. So it was key two, value two, and key two, value four. So what keeps in K table, it's key two, value, value four, because it was, uh, in this case, updated by the previous one, which was value one, uh, sorry, value two. If you convert that stream to a, that K table to a K stream, it's uh, direct mapping, but again, if you update that k table with key two value, sorry, this is no, this is this is wrong, sorry, um, yeah. So let's. I will give you now an example how to use streams to do something. Actually, before that, sorry, <laughs> before that, let's let's try to make it simple first. So I created a stream here. Actually, I create three streams. And you need, what time is it? Okay, 10 minutes. Uh, I just created a bin with, stream, with a stream app. This is the consumer group that we have because it's a consumer and a producer and all the other configurations. And then I have a controller here which has something like publish stream. This is the same thing. It, it will send a message to an input topic. It's uh, exactly the same. But then in the configuration file, Actually, there is an annotation for enabling streams, so I need, I need to enable streams. And where is it? And now I have what I call a simple stream, which is uh, the same as a consumer. It's just consuming from this topic and is creating a value. I'm using here the peak, which is a key and a value, and then it just prints that message. It's as simple as that. And it uses a serializer of a string and also a string because the key and value are strings. Uh, let me add comments. Maybe, maybe I'll run this one. Let me see if I'm forgetting something. Let's see if it runs. And this doesn't add any value because it's almost the same as, as a consumer. Oops. What am I missing? Otherwise, this was not that interesting. I will need this. I might be missing the bin. Let's see if it runs. If it doesn't run, I just skip the streams part, which are almost last, so we won't have a lot of time. Yeah, it's failing. You see, just. Yeah, never mind. Let's skip because we are missing some time. But basically, it prints that message. And then, also, it will, will be fun to show, but that, that's not a problem. So, we have a stream to decompose a given um, a sentence into words. And 
you read from a topic again, which is a key value string string, and then you print. You pass all the words to uh, everything to lowercase. It's like everything is uh, tied up, and then you flat map the values. So you separate every everything in that um, value by word, so by by white space, sorry, and then you produce to this topic. So what we would expect to have is like this topic will have. Imagine that my my phrase was, I'm I am present a, pre making a presentation. Every word will be in a different offset, so it will separate everything. Um, and also, after that, this is the same example. Just finish up the streams. This will give you, and I'm sorry for for not showing the the state star. This will basically count every word uh, that you send. So. What I was going to show you, and I won't be able to make this demo, but but basically you read from a topic, you pass it to lowercase, so key value, just finish this up. You pass it to lowercase, so everything is lowercase. You flat map everything, so everything is like um, um, separated by space, so you create three records. Then you select the key, so the key is the same as the value, you group it by, by key, and then you just count it. So Kafka is one, and streams is two. And this is saved on that state store, and then you can um, check that state store like it's a database. Um, and that's it. So just to finish, I, I know the time is almost finishing, but let's speak again about Kafka Connect. What is Kafka, Kafka Connect is basically something that integrates with third parties. Um, you can think like, a service that it's running outside as well, like schema register, but it goes to a, a third party and grabs info from there and publishes to Kafka, or it can also grab info from Kafka and write to a database, for example. So source uh, goes third party to topics, sync goes to, from topics to third party. So just to finish up, so let's go to conclusions. Uh, there are many competitors with Kafka, I believe. There is, they don't do it the same, but there is RabbitMQ, there is some PubSubs as well. There, there's all cloud providers provide something to you. They don't provide, provide Kafka. And I think Kafka is a steep learning curve. You need a lot to learn a lot how, how it works because you will have some, some stuff that won't uh, work as expected and you need to keep that in mind. Like I said, it's, it's uh, complex so you might need, actually I think you need a, a team to deal with Kafka and support Kafka full time. Because it's like a database, it's something that is uh, the core business uh, of, your, of your business, it's the core of, of your business, so you rely on that to work, so you need to be careful with that. Actually, a bad thing is that it's relying still on Zookeeper, and it's a bit limiting, but it's going away. And my advice is, only choose Kafka if you really, really need to. If you don't need to, go to something simpler. And that's it. <laughs> so any, any more questions? Go ahead. Um, you mentioned throughout many times throughout the presentation that uh, you can store data in Kafka. It didn't work. <laughs> yeah. Is that a wise idea, considering that Kafka is so uh, complex compared to a classic database that you can uh, just produce how to? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Like, I worked with Kafka like from two years ago, and in our business, we don't store anything like permanently on Kafka. Mm -hmm. We store it on database or on Redis, but we don't go to Kafka. I actually don't know if it's a good idea or not. They say it's it's done for that because sometimes is. It's good to um, to write when you need to aggregate information. For mm -hmm. example, you make a transaction like I don't know a deposit, and you need to see the information of that user, like the username, the email, and that information doesn't go inside the deposit transaction. So we just join everything, and further away you need to send an email, so you have every, everything joined. Apart from that, I have no experience saving something permanently on Kafka. Yeah, so I, I cannot advise you to do it or to not do it. I'll but not questions. not doing it at least works. You yeah, you know it works.
Uh, do you know how it works on uh, load balancing side of things? Load balancing? Uh... Yeah, I mean, if you if you need to have uh, two Hepicas to, to work with Kafka or just one. As I said, it's Zookeeper that does that, but Kafka has a lot of configurations. Like the brokers have, I, last time I checked, was like 400 configurations just for brokers. So they work really well together when they work really well together. <laughs> And you, when you have the expertise to configure them well. Because the brokers will take, like if you have a topic with 1K partitions, they should split work equally. But they might not do that. So... Okay, I mean, but, but uh, I think if you have a server down, for example... Uh, a broker, a broker, a Kafka broker down? Yeah, yeah. So... Uh, the other ones should rebalance and take over that, its work. Yeah, but it handles the application of data seamlessly, or I mean, it also... Something. It should, because you have a, a property called replication factor, and you say that, like, for example, you produce a message, and you say the replication factor is 3, and that means that that message will only be available to consumers when it's replicated in at least 3 brokers. If it's not there, it won't be available to consume. Yeah. So, I don't know if I answered your question, yeah, yeah, but if one broker goes down, you still have two with that message. So you should be fine. Makes sense. Uh, in, and on the um, hacking side of things, how, how it works? It's uh, just one, one, one. On the what, sorry? Hacking, hacking the message, acknowledging. Acknowledging the message? Yes. It, uh, it's, it's the same. You communicate the broker, which is the leader of that particular partition. So you just say, okay, I received the message, I'm processing it, and then you commit the offsets that you processed. And then it, I believe it spreads information to all brokers. Okay. Yeah, it's full replicate. That's one of their key features, full replicate. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that's what prevents uh, messages from, for example, being processed uh, at least once or at most once, right? Yeah, yeah, it uses that for, for that, yeah. You have to make some configuration. Sometimes yeah, it's yeah. a configuration, yeah, exactly Sometimes one configuration. I, I, I faced this problem one time. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, exactly once means if you have a stream, for example, it means that you consume the message and go throughout the entire stream and in the end you produce the topic. Mm -hmm. That's exactly once. But it can go, go throughout that stream several times. Yeah. So you need to have idempotency in whatever you are doing inside that stream. Otherwise, you it, write... This for streams, not producers. Or consumers, sorry. Uh, I think for consumers, it can also work can like also, that. If it throws a, an exception and you don't handle, mm -hmm. the offset won't go up. Oh, yeah. it, it so get, it will consume the same message again. So you need to be ready to, to handle with that. Yeah. You said based on the, the, the IT, the, a message gets sent for gets sent to a partition. We need to be careful about conflicts. Not, sorry, not conflict. About the the keys and the the collisions of the keys. So if you need, so based on the key, it will go to a, a given partition, and you know that that key will go to the same partition every time. But Kafka makes like an hash algorithm. I don't know exactly how it does, but it chooses a bucket, and the bucket is a partition. So, if your keys are, you, you have a, a betting website, and every time it's the same user that is doing lots of bets, that user will get impacted, right? Because it will fall every time in the same partition. So, if your, if your keys are not well spread, they won't um, take over, like, uh, take advantage of all the partitions that you have, because, because they will be concentrated in a portion of the partitions. But for that, you can write a partitioner and you can write a custom one to fit your needs if you want. So it, you ca it can be a random or something that you want and it will handle for you. Yeah, that's a good question. Is everything? Awesome. So today, um, my, my goal with, with this talk is 
to uh, to de demonstrate if it's possible to to write uh, uh, programs in Java using uh, function program functional programming. And for that, we are going to do a little experiment during this uh, during this talk. Um, and also see the result of that uh, that experience. Um, so, first first thing that we should define is wh what is functional programming. Um, uh, for me, it's a it's a style of, of programming. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be incorporated in OOP. Um, an object oriented. Um, it's not the contrary. So, but, but, so it's functional programming is not a paradigm as is object oriented. So we can use both on the same um, source. Um, and yeah, also. If you want, if we want to find something that is contrary to this type of programming, we can see, uh, we can view imperative programming as something that is the, the contrary of this uh, of this kind of programming. So functional programming is more declarative, and we normally, uh, when we write, when we program using this this kind of uh, Using functional programming, we we tend to write what we want then, instead of how we are going to to achieve some kind of goal by, by programming. Uh, okay, and functional programming also consists about immutability and composing functions. So it's all, it's all about these two aspects, and all other aspects derive from these two. Um, one of the main aspects of functional programming is that functions are, are deterministic and they don't have side effects. So th that means that for the same arguments, the function always returns the same results. Um, also, by, by side effects is that the function does not change anything uh, outside of the scope of the, the function. It does not change anything. Um, yeah, with these restrictions, it seems impossible to, to write programs, but yeah, we can. There are, there are ways to, to, um, to, to follow these, these restrictions and still uh, write programs. Uh, function, um, yeah, uh, useful programs using functional programming. That's better. Um, so, yeah, my, one of the so Java has has, has evolved uh, in the last years, uh, specifically since the version eight, um, and they provide us many capabilities to to write uh, Java using functional programming. Uh, one of them is Stream API, uh, Lambda Expressions, um, Functional Interfaces, which these three um, features were added on Java 8. And more recently, we have uh, Switch Expressions um, and also Record Classes. Record Classes allows us to write uh, or to define types that are immutable by, by default. Um, and ex switch ex expressions allows us to write a more declarative code uh, as well. Uh, for that, uh, during this talk, uh, I'll use, I'll try to write uh, a very simple um, web framework, an MVC web framework, uh, using only um, characteristics of using only functional programming and Java. Uh, and the, this simple uh, web framework 
has the capability to to have filters and the capability to 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 add controllers. So it's a, a normal MVC framework that we are our, we are all used to to work on our or not. But yeah, they are very known on doesn't. Um, so one of the first components um, of this web framework that we can uh, look at are the, the types that represent the request and the HTTP response. Um, this can be defined. This, at at first glance, um, they can be immutable. So we can define using record classes, um, um, and they by default are are immutable. Um, uh, before having record classes, we also could have immutable types on on Java, but I think this it makes it more easy to write immutable types uh, on on Java. Also, uh, one of so the framework the framework allows us to have controllers, and since we are trying to write these using only functional programming, we can define a controller as a function that receives an HTTP request and it returns an HTTP response. So that's that's a controller. Uh, but it, it would be useful that our our framework that we are trying to write uh, would allow us to should should allow us to allow allows us to, to create um, a controller in a in an easy way. For that we can we have a function named controller that receives an action that can be composed uh, that receives a function that is an action. An action is uh, um, something that receives an HTTP request and runs some kind of business logic and then provides uh, a result. In this case, is it, in this case, is a generic type named T, T model, and we have also a view. Uh, that is also a function that receives a generic type T model from action and then it, re it renders into a string that will be later uh, transformed into an HTTP response. Um, the body of this function, uh, as you can see, we are only composing functions here um, and we are not using any kind of library, we are just using. Uh, the pack functions package from 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 Java, uh, and that's that's it. Um, so this way, the, our frame. This is this is one of the way that our framework allows us to create controllers for us. We, we, we later we'll see how this can be used by a developer. Um, and yeah, the the controller returns. Uh, a function, as I said, which is a function that receives an HTTP request and it returns an HTTP response. Okay, so we defined what a controller is uh, using functions on our on our framework. Um, also, uh, a router can be defined as a function as well. So can define the router as a function that receives the, an HTTP request and then it returns a controller. Uh, so it chooses which controller to run for uh, for some uh, HTTP request that, that comes. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. In, in this case, we the, the router uses the the resource path from the HTTP request to to choose. So our our, frame, our framework should allow us should allow to um, to create a router also in an easy in an easy way. For that we have um, a function named router that receives a map. Uh, uh, 
that uh, associates a, a path with a controller and and using that map, it returns a function that represents a router. So it's a router based on the path. If, if, the, if, the, if it doesn't exist, it will return a not found controller, uh, which basically it, it just responds for for and that's it. Uh, yeah, one of the aspects of uh, programs that use functional programming are that uh, functions are first first class, and as we can see, Java allows us allows us to have to to use function as a first class value. So we are able to to return uh, functions. So a function is able to return functions, is able to receive functions uh, in a, as an argument as well. We are able to store functions on data structures, as we can see. Uh, on, the, on this map as well. Um, on the previous example, we can see that the function is receiving other functions. So, it's, we can, so function is just a value as some integer or it, it is treated as a value. Um, okay. A filter is also also function can be also defined as a function, uh, and it's just something that receives an HTTP request and returns to the, an HTTP request. It can be the same one. It can be something that is transformed by the filter, but it depends what the, um, the developer will use the filter for. And the whole frame the whole framework is. Um, or yeah, let, let me express this in a way. So the whole program, the whole API or the whole web MVC app is a function that receives an HTTP request and response. And it, and it is a function that is composed by others. In this case, it is composed by a controller, the controller functions, the router and the filter functions. We can see how these all, all these, these, all these all, these all functions glue up. Um, so, as I said, filters are are, are functions that receive HTTP requests and return HTTP requests. Uh, we can have more than one filter on our application, um, and we are combining all the filters in only one filter chain um, using Stream API, uh, uh, which exists since Java 8. Um, and we are using the, the reduce uh, operation to, to, to achieve that. And also we are receiving the, the router function and Basically, we are composing the filter chain with the router, and then apply the, and then basically run the, those functions using the apply fun, the apply method of the function interface. And this, basically, this this method will will return the the whole app. Um, okay, so. With these functions, we, we have defined our whole very simple uh, web framework. Uh, so, if someone wants to use these this framework, uh, this is this is an example of how someone can use that. Um, so, we are calling a server server function, which receives the router on as a first parameter and it receives multiple filters uh, as a second or third and fourth per parameters as many we can. Um, also the router receives uh, the con uh, receives controllers uh, that we can associate with a, with a path and, and that's, that's how we can define the whole, whole application using our framework that we defined. Um, uh, 
Oh, yeah. Um, okay, so I can make a little demonstration about about these. Um, going to run so basically we have defined that uh, basically um, an, an web application using the functions that we, we have defined um, and we have run hello and it will return the expected response and it will run all the filters as we defined here. Um, yeah, this is going to this is going to be a very short short talk. Um, um, that's, that's it. Um, no, No, does anyone have questions about about this? Or? Uh, Belu, uh, can you explain to me uh, what would be the benefits of using this uh, the, the function of programming to write uh, this? Okay. Uh, so one one of them is you have you can write a more declarative code, so it's more easy to read uh, versus when comparing to imperative codes, uh, so that's that's a plus. Uh, also, having deterministic functions, you are more you are you can easily unit test them um, as well. Um, also, having immutable uh, immutable using immutable uh, types. You can avoid um, um, bugs nat naturally. You can also avoid uh, concurrency issues as well. So that that are the most uh, known. Uh, also, this is a bit my opinion, but and you can ha write a more simpler code, but that. That's a bit opinionated view. Um, yeah, the, the mostly you you can. I think I don't I don't think this is the nothing that the, we should all write uh, code using functional programming. But I think it's good to know uh, that there is a possibility to use these these aspects on uh, on our daily basis. So. Um, um, we can, as I can say, as I said uh, in my on the first slide, that we can use functional programming uh, features uh, on on our OOP source code, uh, uh, and that's um, yeah, that's I think yeah. The, the main advantage is you can have declarative code, which I can say that it's an advantage having the declarative code. It's more easy to read. Um, using immutable types, you can avoid many problems uh, from concurrency issues to some nasty bugs that you might have regarding mutating data. That, yeah, that's the vote. <coughs> and that way to AMP uh, uh, sorry, AMP approach uh, aspect targeted programming, uh, which is Spring, for example, when you have a lot of magic annotations, uh, you could uh, explicitly read and uh, use your idea just to click a button and read what actually happens. And uh, as a result, you have uh, more uh, understanding what actually happened. Yeah, um, it's more easy to also to so if you have little building blocks that are functions that you can build from bottom up, so it's more easy to to write 
it's more, it's I, w I won't say it's more easy, but it's uh, another way of thinking and writing applications. And, and what would be the disadvantages of using the programming? Um, one of them can be complex uh, dealing with uh, side effects. You, when you deal with side effects, you need to use structures like mon monads uh, that hide uh, the side effects. So um, that's um, that be, can be complex, but it does not does need does not need to be. But um, yeah, but, yeah when, when you are dealing with side effects, you need to write more complex code just to deal with side effects uh, if you wouldn't be following these these restrictions uh, you wouldn't have those problems dealing with side effects and yeah but yeah yeah you have you have disadvantages with this and that's one of them you can be, can be complex taming uh, it can can become very complex taming uh, side effects on a on a program that uses only functional programming. That's uh, one of the disadvantages. Uh, and uh, just, just to finish, uh, I don't want to take the time. Uh, I, I saw that uh, in, in that example, uh, you use it a lot of uh, function, uh, which is one of the interfaces that Java provided. Uh, if I wanted to, to make it uh, how can I say more declarative? Uh, could I use something different from a uh, function to describe my uh, number expression? Yeah. Uh, so this is a functional functional interface that is already offered by the Java Util package. Um, you can have your own functional interfaces only. Um, to write functional interface, you just need to have an interface that has only one, one method, and that's that's a functional interface. And you can have lambda, lambda expressions that represent those uh, um, those functional interfaces. Um, we could simplify here, and for example, we could have an interface that extends from function, an interface named controller that extends from function of HTTP request and HTTP response and it would become much simpler. I, I didn't do that here because I wanted to, to demonstrate. Uh, <coughs> I think it would become very, very complex to, to, to show it here, but uh, that's the only reason I didn't do it. But that's, that's possible to... Also, the, the ones that we have on the Java Util package uh, uh, are very... I won't say more than enough, but there are already many functional interfaces there that can can be used in many scenarios that I think we don't need to have a... They, unless we are, we, you, are, you, you are type creating a new type to represent this function, for example, uh, that makes sense, but um, there's no need to create... Uh, most of the cases, we don't need to create new functional interfaces. The, the ones that we have are can do the job that we, we need. That's. Does anyone have other the questions about? Uh, two simple ones. Uh, the first one: What's a monad? I'm joking. Um, <laughs> one, uh, one of the uh, I know it's a taco. Um, mm -hmm. What uh, one of the biggest problems that I have when trying to introduce them, uh, the fundamentals of uh, functional programming to people is that people usually have issues with the immutability aspect because all they do is mutate objects and they can really conceive in a, of another way. What do you recommend or suggest in these situations in order to guide people along to uh, the golden path, so to speak? Okay. Uh, so, if on the context of Java, uh, for example, um, we, we can... We can f I wouldn't say force, but yeah, not not the best word. But I, I would say re recommend using Stream API to mutate data. Um, I think if so, most most of the work that we do on a daily basis is transform data from from lists to maps to 
or to, from a list to a, to a value. Uh, and most of these kind of computations that we write can be done using Stream API. And when we use Stream API, we don't need to mutate data. So um, if those people that are very, uh, they, have, they struggle using immutable data, I think using Stream API will make it more easy to use uh, immutable data because there is no need to mutate. You, need, you just need to transform instead of mutate the data. That's, uh, I think that's one of the recommendations that I would uh, add on a team. If uh, it. um, yeah, that's you. Uh, I don't know. Is there anyone has other, another? Another? <laughs> 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 um, no, no one have, has another, another question. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Uh, it was a pleasure having you here.